Just by way of motivation, as all of you know, people are living longer, you know, despite the fact that the U.S. isn't doing as well as some other countries. Even in the U.S., life expectancy for both men and women age 60 has gone up a lot in the, in the last decades. A lot of older adults need to keep working or would like to keep working, though maybe not full-time or, or full-year. Um, so the, the goal for my talk is to consider the role that self-employment currently plays and potentially could play in helping workers meet those needs and desires. So just by way of background, um, I, my, I should say my, the, the data that I'm going to be talking about are data for the U.S., but I'm hoping that some of what I say will, will resonate with the experience in, in other countries. In the United States, the employment rates for both men and women at older ages have gone up a lot. So for men, after having been you know, falling for a period of time, beginning in the 1980s, the 1990s, employment rates at older ages started to go up. For men aged 60 to 64, they've gone up between 1994 and 2022 by something over 10 percentage points, which is a huge increase. For men aged 65 to 69, the increases have been, which is that yellow line, have been even bigger. Interpreting what's happened for women is a bit more difficult because, as we know, you, women had been coming into the labor force in bigger numbers generally. So partly for women, it's not just the relative employment rates for older women have gone up, but employment rates for women overall have been rising, but you can see their employment rates have gone up a lot. There's a lot of reasons for why employment rates have been rising. There's increases in longevity. People know they have more years ahead of them. There's the shift in employment towards less physically demanding jobs. In the U.S. context, there's changes in Social Security that reduce the penalties for working past the so-called normal retirement age, at least up through age 70. But then there's also been effectively cuts in Social Security benefits as we've raised the age of full retirement at which you get full benefits. And then, of course, there's the shift from defined benefit to defined contribution retirement plans, you know, all of which have led people to want to work more, and we've seen that reflected in the data to some extent. That said, despite the increases in employment that we've seen, I think there's evidence of a lot of untapped interest in working at older ages. Um, you know, we know that bridge jobs are common. Chris has worked on this, among, among others. But it's also the case that a lot of people who say they would like to keep working after retirement don't end up doing so. I would point to a study by Nicole Maestas um, that was carried out in 2010 looking at data from the Health and Retirement Survey. About 71% of people interviewed in the first wave of the survey said they would like to keep working after they retired, but if you follow them over time, only about half of them actually do so. There's a very interesting paper by uh, John Amerix and a whole set of co-authors that involved asking people aged 56 and older who were not currently employed, most of them were in their 60s and 70s, about their interest in working. A really high fraction of them said that they would be interested in working. About 36% said they would be interested in working if they could get the same conditions that they'd had on their last job. About 60% said they would be interested in working if they had more flexibility on their, on their hours. Um, the people in that 60%, about 20% of them would have accepted a pay cut of 20% or more in order to, to be working. I mean, there's a caveat. This sample that they looked at were more educated, higher income than the population as a whole. But I think there is evidence of a lot of untapped interest in working at older ages. So then one might ask, why is it that more older people aren't working? And I think there's a variety of reasons. One is that, as I said, the people, older people who are interested in working and aren't currently working now would like more flexibility. But it's really hard to reduce your hours on your current job. Looking back again at the Health and Retirement Survey, some work that I did some years ago now with Susan Hausman, um, People, one of the questions people were asked was whether they thought their employer 
would let them reduce their hours on the current job, only about a quarter said that they thought that that was going to be an option. That's consistent with more recent evidence. The, survey of the, the Society of Human Resource Management did a survey of its member firms in 2018 and asked them if, about if they had phased retirement programs. Only 5% of them did. Even if you, they, they, there was another question about, do you do this on an informal basis? Even with that, it was only about 20% of them. Um, and the, the consequence of that is that people you know, on a job who say that what they'd like to do, if they have plans for retirement in the next few years, what they'd like to do, if they say that what they'd like to do is cut back on their hours, very few of them are actually able to realize those plans. That's in contrast to people who say they'd like to stop working. They can do that. Or people who say they want to keep working. They can do that. But the people who say they'd like to cut back their hours mostly can't do that. What they end up doing instead is either continuing to work full time or uh, just stop working altogether. So that's one issue, the lack of flexibility. Um, if you, you might think that you could shift to a job with another employer, but employers are reluctant to hire older workers. There's a lot of evidence from you know, these, these studies where you send out applications to employers and see who gets a call back, that uh, older female applicants to um, entry-level jobs, you know, applicants to a variety of, of types of jobs are less likely to get a call back. There's a lot of reasons why that might be the case. It may be that these older workers lack in-demand skills. In the U.S. context, the health insurance costs for older workers are a, a real consideration. It may just be discrimination, you know, mistaken perceptions about the abilities of, of older workers. And then there's the issue that a lot of older workers haven't looked for a job for a long time, and they, they may be less successful at doing that. Um, you know, some Older workers end up getting displaced from their job, and so that throws them into the, the labor market. It's not just the people who might be interested in changing jobs. It's the people who involuntarily are in that position. The, the consequence of all of this is that older workers, are, older job seekers are less likely to, to find a new job. So you know, my sense is that there's a lot of untapped interest in working at older ages, but it's hard for older workers to find their way into a position that's consistent with what they want to supply to the, to the labor market. There's a lot of ways that one might think about this. I mean, there's things that you could imagine doing to try to you know, educate employers about the abilities of older workers or to you know, maybe make it so that people who are 65 and older have Medicare as their primary insurance so that it's less of a concern for employers to put them on their health insurance plans. But what I want to talk about is self-employment as a possible avenue towards continued um, employment at older ages. Being an independent contractor could be a, an attractive alternative to wage and salary employment at older ages. The schedule may be more flexible. And this issue about health insurance, which is a big issue for people who are independent contractors at younger ages, is likely to be less of an issue for older workers. And I'll come back to talking about the gig economy at, at the end. At least in the United States, there is an issue about how we measure self-employment. If you look at data from household surveys, they just show the self-employment rate being flat for a long period of time. But I think that's wrong. I think there's at least two issues with how we measure self-employment in household survey data in the U.S. One is that I think a significant share of these people who are independent contractors and thus self-employed are miscoded in the data as wage and salary workers. In the CPS, what people are asked is, were you employed by government, by a private company, a nonprofit organization, or were you self-employed? You know, people don't listen to questions that carefully. If you were an independent contractor working for some company, you might just say yes right at the beginning of that question. Yes, I work for this private company. There is a supplement to the CPS that tries to get at this, but for reasons that I won't go into the details about, I think it probably doesn't pick all of them up. So that's one issue. Another issue is that some of this sort of independent contractor self-employment work probably isn't reported at all. Uh, people don't think of it as a job, and they, 
you know, in answering these questions on the CPS, they just don't think to report it. Um, evidence for that being an issue is that when you really probe people and say, did you do these sorts of inf more informal things, an awful lot of them say, yes, they did. And it, but it, it doesn't show up in answering the standard CPS questions. It's mainly second jobs, but it's also some jobs that are the main thing that people are doing. So in earlier work, um, I and a set of collaborators tried to get at how, much, how big of an issue this was by looking at how what you see in the survey data compares to what you see in tax data. Um, we linked up data from the current population survey to tax records, and we looked at people who reported self-employment income over the year in both sources of data. So these are the same people. We're measuring something that's conceptually comparable. It should be the same. Uh, it's wildly different. So you can, um, this is data for the period from 1996 through 2015. So here's what you, you get. If you look at the, the dashed blue line, these are just numbers of people with self-employment income, the dashed blue line is people who consistently say, yes, I had self-employment income. We know there's underreporting in tax data, that there's people who have income they don't tell the government about. That's the red line. It's, there's as many of them as report consistently, but it hasn't changed very much. What's changed over time is the people who don't tell you about having any self-employment income in the CPS, but you see it in the tax data, which suggests problems with the survey estimates. These people fall into different categories. The bottom, I guess we don't have a laser pointer here, the, the bottom line there is people who don't say anything about employment in the CPS, but they have income in the tax data. The, the small dots are the people who don't report a second self-employment job in the, tax, in the CPS. And the, the dashed line is the people who say in the CPS that they're wage and salary workers, but they have self-employment income only. So I think there's an issue. In an effort to learn more about what really was going on with self-employment in the, the U.S. data, um, so a different set of collaborators and I contracted with the Gallup organization to do a survey that was an add-on to um, an ongoing survey of, of theirs. We were trying to find out about these measurement issues, develop a bit of a better understanding about who works in, in self-employment, and especially ask some questions about older workers, about their independent contractor work. The survey was a phone survey asking about employment in the prior week, so you know, more comparable to the CPS than a lot of the online surveys that have, have been done to try to learn about gig economy activity and so on. Um, it was people 18 to 80 who were surveyed. We got about 60,000 responses. The response rate to the survey, I just full, <laughs> full acknowledgement, uh, was about 10%, which is, you know, I, I wish it was higher. Our employment estimates, our, you know, our overall employment estimates match up fairly well to the CPS, especially if you exclude very low hours work, though how the employment is characterized is different. Um, the survey data are weighted to match the characteristics of the U.S. population. So just what was this survey getting at? We were stuck with the standard questions that Gallup asks about employment, which aren't quite like the CPS questions, you can read them there. You know, they asked about work for an employer. The question is kind of similar to the CPS question that's used to categorize people's employment. And then they asked separately about self-employment. Um, so what did we do to try to, to get at um, this, you know, things that might be missing and some things that might be mismeasured? We started out by doing focus groups to find out what people who were independent contractors, how they talked about their work. One thing that was really clear from these focus groups was that a lot of people who are independent contractors talk about themselves as working for employers, which is kind of consistent with the, the suspicion that we had. So what did we do in the survey? We started with the basic Gallup question, and then for people who said they worked for an employer, we followed up by asking them in one of a couple of different ways, 
whether they were an independent contractor. We either asked them directly or we asked them if their employer took taxes out of their pay. A stunningly large fraction of the people who said that they worked for an employer when we probed said, oh yeah, I'm an independent contractor. It was you know, a little bit more on people's second jobs, but that was true of about 8% of the employees on people's primary jobs. So it looks like there's an issue. Um, the, so that's one thing that we're getting at is this miscoding. The other thing that we're getting at is, you know, are we capturing all the work that people are doing? And I'll just say that I think that the way these questions on the Gallup survey were designed are better suited to picking up some of the low hours work that the CPS may be missing. We had some additional questions that we asked of people age 50 and over who were categorized as an independent contractor. So what did we learn about self-employment at older ages, which is my topic for, for today? Um, well, going back to the tax data that I described to you, we have, you know, for this period from 1996 to 2015, data on the self-employment rate in the CPS. It's the share of workers who are self-employed on their, you know, either at all or on their main job. And then we have the same thing from the annual social and economic supplement to the CPS that asks about income over the prior year. The dark lines, red and blue, or red and black, are the, um, any self-employment. The dashed lines are your main job. Um, both data sets show self-employment rising with age, but the tax data show significantly bigger increases in self-employment with age than the survey data. And that's especially true when you look at more educated workers. The gap between those two estimates, if you focus on the dash lines, which are the main jobs, rises from about a little over three percentage points at age 55 to a gap of more than eight and a half percentage points at age, at age 70. So that's telling us, I think, that the CPS data aren't capturing a lot of things. And boy, this slide really doesn't come through when you project it, and I apologize for that. What this slide is showing you is what we get out of our Gallup survey data. The dark blue bars are just the self-independent contractor employment, sort of what, what Tito, you've called solo self-employment in some of your work in the, the, at different ages. Over on the right are data from the contingent worker supplement to the CPS, which is asking about the same things. And they're giving a somewhat similar pattern. We have a somewhat higher rate. But then when you add in these people that we identify as independent contractors who originally said they were employees, it's much higher. And it goes up much faster with age um, than just the original answers to the questions. Um, so who are these people who are working as you know, independent contractors at, at older ages? It's mainly more educated people. If you, what this chart is showing you is the share of the population that's employed, not the share of employees, but the share of the population that's employed by status on their main job, the yellow line at the top on the upper left is people with a graduate degree and then lower levels of education. You know, employ, it, employment as an employee falls for everybody. But if you look down in the lower left, that's independent contractors. For people, you know, highly educated people, you actually get more or you know, a similar rate of employment as an independent contractor, even at quite old ages. If you just look at the share of employment that's employment as an independent contractor, it's really going up, and especially for the more educated people at older ages. And you just would not see this if you looked at data from the current population survey. Um, we asked some other questions, and I'll just, just briefly describe the, you know, what we, we learned from those. We asked people about whether they're we, we were able to see in our data whether that independent contract work was a second job. Um, not surprisingly, the share of people working as an independent contractor for whom it's a second job in addition to something else falls a lot with age. Though even at the oldest ages, there are people who are doing independent contract work as a second job. 
The other thing that we found interesting was that a lot of these people who are working as an independent contractor are working for a formal employer. What we don't know, unfortunately, is whether they got pushed into doing that or whether it was something they really wanted to, to be doing. Uh, the last thing that I'll describe for you is the responses to our, the question on our survey about why people were doing this. Um, it could have been to earn more money, it could have been more just to stay active, it could have been to pursue an interest or a hobby, uh, it could have been because it was the only type of work they could get. Again, perhaps not surprisingly, at old, the oldest ages, the share of people who are working and give us their main reason to earn money you know, falls with age. That's not why the, most of the very oldest people are working, but there's still a lot of them who say they're doing it to earn money. Very few are saying it's because it's the only type of job they could get. So what, is, what does this add up to? Um, I mean, I think I mean, this, this, is, this work is intended at this point mainly to, to give a better picture of what self-employment at older ages looks like. And I think a clear takeaway, both from the tax data uh, linked to the CPS and from this new survey data that we've collected is that self-employment at older ages is a lot higher than I think we would have understood from looking at surveys like the CPS or the American Community Survey. Um, I think the likely explanation is that some of these people are mis being miscoded as working for an employer. And it's important to know that because you know, from a public policy point of view, the protections and, and so on afforded to self-employed people are very different than those afforded to employees. I, I think there's also some cases where we just miss independent contractor work altogether. A second thing that's a clear takeaway is that this, at this point, that self-employment and especially working as an independent contractor is more prevalent for more educated people. Um, among the self-employed, most of them who are still working at older ages, the, mo the most common form of self-employment is being an independent contractor. Um, and finally, at older ages, there's fewer of these people who work for financial reasons than at younger ages, but there's still a lot of them for whom the money is an important, important to their well-being. So let me just, you know, I'm, I'm not going to try to do an exhaustive discussion of, of, of policy implications, but I, I think that this does at least suggest some things to think about. So one thing I think it suggests thinking about is how public institutions that are set up to help people with finding jobs or finding employment function vis-a-vis -vis older workers. So we have you know, programs in the United States that are focused on displaced workers. We have programs for adult workers. We don't have any separate programs for older workers, but the needs of older people may be quite different than the needs of younger people. Um, so I think developing job placement programs that were um, focused on older workers would be a potentially valuable thing. One issue I suspect for the staff who work in the employment service is that the way they're evaluated may discourage them from taking up older people as, as clients. The reason is because the way that they're evaluated is in part based on how much people earn on the jobs that they get compared to what they were earning before. And if you're talking about an older population that's interested in cutting back on their hours and having more flexibility, they're probably, even if they're successful in their job search, not going to earn as much as they were before. So thinking about what those evaluation metrics look like um, could be important. And then, I, you know, so related to what I've been talking about, we, we, the, the, the performance metrics are constructed primarily based on unemployment insurance wage records, which capture wages paid by employers. So trying to do a better job of, of supporting interest from older workers in self-employment is something that also would seem like a good idea. And then the second thing that I would think about in terms of policy implications is the, the whole... You, set of issues around regulating the gig economy. So for a lot of 
you know, there's a lot of concerns about people being categorized as independent contractors and, and put in that role instead of being hired as employees and, you know, tightening up on when a firm can do that and when they can't and, you know, tightening up on those regulations. And I, I guess my concern is that we, we want to be careful that appropriately regulating the gig economy doesn't close potential opportunities for older workers that might help them to realize their interest in continuing to work in a more flexible, in a more flexible way. So, I mean, there, there clearly are reasons to be concerned about the growth of the gig economy, uh, growth of independent contractor employment more generally, but a lot of the reasons to be concerned about that are less applicable to older workers. Um, you know, the lack of health insurance benefits. It's not a big issue if you're over 65 and are qualified for Medicare. Um, the, the concerns about more limited opportunities for career progression because you're not part of the firm's internal labor market, that's probably going to be less of a concern for older workers. So I, I don't have, you know, clear policy, rec you know, specific policy recommendations, but I think this is a set of issues to, to be thinking about. And then I have a bunch of slides that I won't show you that are just the list of all of the, the references that I cited that might be useful to have up online. So that's my, that's what I had to say. Okay, so let's, the microphones are not forthcoming. Maybe, here they come. Okay. So we'll start with Chris and then Andrew, and then over here, so start from this direction. So I do. I do. If I called people out by name, they would feel like they needed to make comments. <laughs> uh, so, Catherine, is this on? Yeah. Catherine, yeah. that was really interesting, and I'm totally convinced that we undercount um, uh, this kind of employment, self-employment, with uh, the CPS data. I guess a question I have is: Could some of what you're doing, in a meaningful way, overcount it? What I'm thinking about is somebody's technically self-employed, but you know they're they're working five hours a month uh, as an independent contractor for mm -hmm. their former employee. And yeah, they're technically self-employed, but yeah. in some meaningful sense, maybe we shouldn't be you know, thinking of them in some of the buckets you're putting them into. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, we can look at that to some extent in the linked data with the CPS linked to the tax data. There's you're sort of three buckets of people there. There's the people who um, aren't, don't report any employment in the CPS, and then we, they show up with some of this work. You know, even they are earning, you know, over the course of the year, I, I'm not going to remember the exact figures, you know, like eight to $10,000 a year. So it's not peanuts. And the people who are, um, you know, second, have second jobs that are self-employment are earning quite a bit. The people who are miscoded are earning a lot. The, the people who are employees in the CPS and self-employed in the, in the tax data. So if, if you add it all up, it's, it's mostly fairly substantial employment. It is true in the Gallup data that you know, some of what we're getting is people who are working less than 15 hours a week. But even there, it's, it's substantial numbers of hours on average. So I... I who have worried about that and, and convinced myself that this was, there was enough of this, there was enough there there to be worrying about this. Uh, thank you, really enjoyed the presentation and all your work as well. I, I think this is incredibly important because as careers are getting longer, I think retirement's changing. It's less about the extensive margin of whether people work or not, more the intensive margin. So particularly in the US and UK, less here, I suspect. So really important, and I always learn a lot. I guess I've got two questions, and one of them you sort of showed some data on, but I'm going to ask, not what the data is, I think you haven't got it, but what your instinct is, and mm -hmm. just make a number up, basically. <laughs> um, so the, the first question is, I, I, hang around, you know, I teach at a business school. For various reasons, I come across those highly skilled people that you emphasize were a big part of this. And late 40s, early 50s, they think they're fine. They think they're going to carry on working to retirement, and then they lose their job. 
and then they struggle to get another one, and they go into this category. Mm -hmm. And it's underemployment. I mean, some of this is age-friendly. It's great, flexible hours, autonomy, but some of them, they're just underemployed. And you know, you, you show that a quarter of them are working for their former employer, but I wonder if you have an instinct of how much of this across all buckets is that I'm underemployed rather than taking uh, a, an age-friendly job. And then the second thing is obviously these numbers are much higher for the US than elsewhere. Whether you've got any instinct to how this interacts with things like health insurance? So on your, on your first question about how much of this is voluntary versus yes. involuntary, I mean, clearly some of it's involuntary. My guess would be that most of it's not. And I, I, mean, I, I say that maybe I, I shouldn't pin too much on this. We did ask people who were working as independent contractors what the main reason they were doing it was. And very few of them said it was because it was the only type of work they could get. And maybe I'm, we're not getting honest answers, but it, it makes me think it's probably not the main driver. So you think it's smaller? The involuntary part of it? Um, I think it's modest in size, but I, I'm reluctant to make up numbers. <laughs> and I'm sorry, your second question was? What's interesting? This is so the health insurance, the health insurance. I think the health insurance is a big deal because in, the way that it works in the United States is that as long as you're still employed and your employer is offering health insurance, that health insurance is primary. So. The, and Medicare, if the employee, if the person has it at all, and you don't have to sign up for Medicare at 65 if you're still covered by an employer plan. You know, I think, I think if, we saw, if we shifted things over so that at 65 people could get Medicare and it was primary and that relieved the employer of the burden of the health insurance cost, we would see employers you know, more willing to employ older workers and also more willing to be flexible about having people on part-time. Than, than I think they currently are. Um, one potential <clears throat> way to understand the, the, the discrepancy between survey data and administrative data is that uh, uh, often you have uh, uh, formally self-employment uh, contract that de facto conceal uh, dependent yeah. employment position. So when they have to state this in a survey, they would state to be uh, working as employees, while as a matter of fact they are classified in social security as, uh, as self-employed. This is particularly true uh, in Europe, where there is a lot of that type of uh, temporary employment and may be less in the US, but I think that could be another way to reconcile the, the two sources. And the other consideration is simply related to the fact that uh, uh, there is a lot of heterogeneity in self-employment, and typically they are polarized at the two extremes of the skill distribution would, would yeah. have seen. Either very highly skilled or very low skilled types. Mm -hmm. um, and clearly for the second group, uh, there are very serious concerns about uh, adequacy of pensions and um, in particular uh, the way you could contribute during a period of low employment, or low working hours and uh, these type of things. There are some attempts to develop a sort of unemployment uh, benefit system or way to, to get some contribution uh, being paid for them during mm -hmm. this, this period, but uh, there are big issues yeah. of moral hazard. But there are still some experiences that are quite interesting uh, yeah. in this respect. And I yeah. wonder where no, I think those, those are, are useful observations. You know, I, I think in the US, too, you, some of these independent contractors, if you saw them in the workplace, you would have a very hard time distinguishing them from employees. But I think the fact that they're being I mean, they're there every day, or, well, nobody's there every day anymore. <laughs> but they're, they're working on the same, you know, in the, in the same way that the employees are, are, are working. But I think the fact that they're being paid, you know, that they're classified as independent contractors and paid as independent contractors, you know, at, at younger ages potentially has real consequences for them because they don't, they don't have all of the protections that an employee would have. You mentioned the unemployment insurance. You know, they're responsible for making both the employer and the employee contribution for Social Security and, and so on and, and so on. Um, 
you know, I, I guess to repeat something that I said, I, I do think some of these concerns about the growth in this independent contractor employment, which I think you know, it does raise real issues, and I do think we need to rethink some of our social institutions and tr to try to figure out a way to pro provide more protections to those people. I think they're a lot less applicable to somebody who's 65 or 70 who wants to keep working. I, I was very interested in, in your results. I mean, p part of my question you answered in response to Chris, I mean, how, how much uh, uh, work, uh, how, how we, we measure that. The, the, the other part also about measurement was uh, about the, the flexibility itself, mm -hmm. right? Um, motivation in, towards uh, self-employment is uh, affording flexibility. Mm -hmm. if, if we wanted to measure that flexibility in itself as, as different from, from the amounts, right? How, how, what, what would be the, 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 the way to, to address this? And, and, and kind of... Uh, find it interesting, and that is more, more of a comment than a question, because uh, I, I connect it with, uh, with James' talk, right? I mean, the, in a way, the complexity in, in decision-making of the older ages, when you combine the financial choices with the labor choices, it, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's escalated, right? And, uh, and, 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 the, and I guess the, the, the question in relation to this flexibility is, okay, how much can I count of self-employment uh, activity as a way to smooth my consumption and react to shocks and so on? Mm -hmm. um, so that's a, a, a good question. I, I think if you you're not really gonna get this out of administrative data because all you can see in administrative data is you know, the total amount that people are earning. And you do see that when people retire, they're, they're earning, if they keep work, if they say they're retired, their earnings drop off, which is suggestive that they're finding a way to work less and a lot of them are doing it through self-employment. But I think if you were trying to collect information through a survey, you'd wanna ask people things like, you know, do you have control over the hours that you work each week? And, you know, if you wanted to take a block of time off from your employment, would you be able to do that? That sort of question would be a way to, to, to get at it, I think. Um, I need, there's, there's some surveys. I, I actually hadn't thought about trying to look at this question in that way. There, there are some surveys that ask people about their, um, the con their control over their schedules. And I, I, you, we might be able to tease something out of that. The survey of household and economic decision make, household economic decision making that the Federal Reserve Board in, in the U.S. does, asks, has asked questions about that that might be illuminating. Can I just follow up on that? I, um, I think First of all, we, we've been trying to do a little bit on that, on flexibility for older workers in some of the aging studies. So yeah. HRS is putting in a module on older workers in the gig economy, I think, but it takes them a long time to do things, to decide what to do. We've put one in on, in ELSA already. Mm -hmm. But one of the dimensions of flexibility I think is relevant is exactly what you related to, blocks of time and maybe being yeah. able to take different periods of the year off. Yes. Uh, and that's one of the reasons the tax data is going to be different from the CPS because the CPS is only ever asked about the survey week, whereas the tax data is going to be the accumulated. Year. I should have been. I should have been. I was yeah. trying to make sure I covered everything. I should have been clearer when I said linking up the CPS to the tax data. Mm. It was the data from the social annual social and economic supplement, which was asking about earnings yeah. over the prior year. Yeah. So it okay. should be so comparable. In, in the data the sense, it should have matched. But I think data, that yeah. particular dimension of flexibility the one that allows older workers to go on their holidays when all the families with kids are at home right. because their kids are in school and that makes the holidays cheaper yeah. and quieter and everything else. That, that, that organizational thing, I think, particularly at the top end, is a real benefit for the older workers. Mm -hmm. And uh, how much of that is driving their choices, I think, is a real interesting question. Yeah. I, would, I would agree, yeah.